Hi, my name is Gerald Fogarty. I'm a radiation oncologist at St Vincent's Hospital, Sydney, and also the Mater Hospital, Sydney. I work for Genesis Cancer Care, who run those two departments. So I'm presenting to you an update in radiotherapy, especially for skin cancer. So the talk plan is the, is the following. Go to, we're going to look at how radiotherapy works, and I'm going to focus on tissue preservation or conservation. I'm also going to talk about the radiation process for patients, what patients need to go through in order to get to radiotherapy. I'm also going to look at side effects of radiotherapy, both in the acute and late term. And then I'm also going to address new breakthroughs that have happened in radiotherapy in physics and biology. So how does radiotherapy work? Radiotherapy is the DNA. DNA is the genetic material in the cell nucleus. It's got to be functioning well for cells to divide. It's essential for cancers to grow and for organs to maintain themselves. Radiotherapy causes damage to DNA. So the DNA doesn't work, it doesn't divide properly. So what happens is the cells don't divide, they eventually wear out and die. So let's have a look at these cartoons here. We can see that ionizing radiation causes double-stranded breaks in the DNA. Then there are nonsense recombinations. And because of this, the DNA cannot divide at cell division. And this can either lead to immediate death or death at apoptosis or even death at cell division. We can see two cells here. The cell uh, on this side of the screen is basically a cell in the later stages of mitosis. We can see that all the chromosomes have split. The chromatids now is uh, heading to either this pole or to that pole. The cytoplasm will lice through here and we're going to end up with two cells. This cell on the other side has been irradiated. There have been nonsense recombinations. We can see that this cell cannot divide. Therefore, if we can stop the cancer cell dividing, why do we need to cut it out? That would be our answer to some of the surgeons. Radiotherapy is targeted therapy. It is a localised treatment. It is like surgery. It is physically targeted. It is not like chemotherapy. Radiotherapy only affects radiotherapy volumes. So, for example, if someone is getting radiotherapy to the chest, they will not lose the hair on their head. Lots of effort goes into ensuring that only the physical target is treated. And this process is called planning because radiotherapy is blind. We need to aim the radiotherapy. So planning is all about where the radiotherapy ends up in the body. Planning is not scheduling. This is an example of a patient with a lot of Merkel cell carcinoma metastatic to lymph nodes in the axilla. The radiation oncologist draws on where the axilla is. We can see down in this photo here, this uh, photo of a scan, an axial scan, we can see that the red represents where the radiation oncologist thinks the cancer is. Now, the radiation planners have already put on a beam that comes from the front and goes right through the body and exit out, exit out the back. The, there's also a corresponding beam that starts out the back and goes right through from the posterior, exiting out the anterior. So we can see the problem with using radiotherapy, particularly external beam radiotherapy, is that there's lots of normal tissue also within the full dose of the beam. So and this is just a problem of getting radiotherapy into the body uh, in order for an up dose to kill the cancer. We can see in this last image here that this is what's called a quality assurance film or a port film. And what we're doing is this, we're taking a photo of a scan with the megavolt radiotherapy taking an X-ray. So we're trying to see here whether what, what we're treating is what we've planned to treat. We can see here that uh, if this patient gets a bit of uh, inflammation in the brachial plexus, or even a bit of pneumonitis, as a radiation oncologist, I'm very happy to take the blame. However, if they get heart failure, the heart is outside the radiation volume. So I won't be taking the blame for that. More important than physical targeting, radiation is also biologically targeted. So that within the radiation, within the irradiated volume, normal cells can repair radiotherapy damage. Cancer cells, though, 
lack DNA repair proteins and they cannot repair. So that within a mixed population of normal and tumor cells, radiotherapy can kill the tumor cells and spare the normal cells. This difference in repair between normal cells and tumor cells is exploited in radiotherapy. So what that means is that radiotherapy brings to cancer treatment tissue conservation, whereas surgery always involves tissue sacrifice. So, however, if we give all the dose in a short time, the repair capacity of the normal cells can become swamped. So the cells die and are eventually replaced by fibrosis. So this process can lead to late side effects of radiotherapy, like scarring, whiteness in skin, and teleangiectasia. In order to avoid this, radiotherapy is therefore fractionated or given in a little bit every day. This means that the normal cells can repair between the fractions, but the cancer cells cannot. So that this results in very good tissue conservation. So if people can keep their tissue rather than having it sacrificed, they end up having better quality of life post-radiotherapy and perhaps a better survivorship compared with surgery, which always leads to tissue loss. Radiation on oncology is therefore good for normal tissue preservation or conservation. Common scenarios are that lumpectomy and radiotherapy have replaced mastectomy for early breast cancer so that women can keep their breast. So this is the most common reason worldwide for using radiotherapy. Also using chemoradiotherapy in head and neck cancer, for example, in larynx cancer, we can now preserve 85% of larynxes uh, with preservation of the voice box, whereas surgery always takes the voice box. So also using chemoradiotherapy, there can also be organ preservation in 90% of SCC anus. Using surgery alone, this always leads to needing a bag, but uh, using chemoradiotherapy, there's organ preservation in 90% of SCC anus. We're just going to have a look at an example now of tissue conservation. This is a middle-aged lady with a large neglected squamous cell carcinoma of the right lower lip. This is a large lesion. So the surgical fix to this would be to take the commissure, which is a very important functional subunit of the mouth, and we need to take a good centimetre around here. Uh, so the problem is that's very hard to close with primary closure. So we would need to put some sort of flap or graft in order to close the uh, tissue deficit here. Now, the problem with that is we need to have uh, end up with a mouth that is continent, can keep in food and fluid, and also competent, which can do things like uh, kiss and say words and uh, articulate well. So this is a very difficult for foreign tissue here because it may not work out. There may even be nerve loss it could also be compromised of vascular supply leading to graft breakdown because this is a large lesion. Both necks would need to be addressed because this crosses the midline. So there's a good possibility there could already be SCC in these lymph nodes on this side of the neck and also on this side of the neck. So what we're looking for here is a modality that can preserve the normal structure. Now, radiation oncologists would believe that the lip is still there. So we need a modality that can get rid of the cancer, but within the same field, keep the normal structure. So we would treat this with definitive radiotherapy involving both the neck and with the, and with the lip. That's what she was treated with. So after treatment, she gets to keep her lip. She gets to keep her lines, all her muscles, all her nerves. She ends up with a competent mouth, with a continent mouth, and she also had radiotherapy treatment of the lymph nodes to a neck, which were neg negative clinically, but, uh, um, but were treated anyway within the same radiation field. Now, if we look up closely, we can see that here's the line of the tumour. We can see that this lip was still there, and, but just that this is where the tumour was. This is the, the tumour bed. 
So isn't that great how radiotherapy can get rid of the cancer but keep the normal tissue? You know, there's a little bit of uh, tissue loss here. That could be from over vigorous fractionation or over vigorous brachytherapy. She was treated with a combination of external beam and brachytherapy. But anyway, this lady gets to keep her tissue and therefore has hopefully better quality of life and survivorship rather than losing part of her tissue. What about radiotherapy in skin cancer? Well, we can use radiotherapy in different ways. We can use it in a definitive manner, radiotherapy alone, just like in the previous example. I use the series from Peter McCallum Cancer Centre where I trained in Melbourne. So for T1, N0, BCCs and SCCs, this is for lesions less than two centimetres in size, which is the usual, so that at three years using surgery alone, the success rate of infield control is 99%. With radiotherapy, it's 97%. However, this was a retrospective study of over a thousand patients. So there could have been unequal selection. Those who perhaps could not have surgery went into the radiotherapy arm, and usually they're a less fit population. So to me, surgery and radiotherapy are just about the same for definitive treatment. What about post-operative radiotherapy? That is after, after surgery for a lesion where there are uh, unexpected high risk factors found, for example, a positive margin or um, uh, uh, invading into another tissue called a T4 lesion on the TNM end, TMN staging. So the success depends on the initial size of the lesion, the histopathology, and the existence of immunosuppression. But we use this a lot, this portal post-operative radiotherapy. And we do this in combination with our multidisciplinary colleagues, the plastic surgeons, the dermatologists, and skin cancer GPs. What about in the salvage situation where a cancer comes back after previous surgery or pre previous topical therapies failed? Well, the success rate is about 80% control at three years, but once again, it depends on the size. And we also use radiotherapy a lot in palliation. So if we've got maybe a, a person who can't handle a full course of radiotherapy, but their lesions are bleeding, smelling, needing bandages, we can easily give them one to five fractions of radiotherapy to stop this, to take away these symptoms for them. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this can be repeated if these symptoms ever come back. What about the radiotherapy process for patients? Well, usually there's a concern by their primary carer that there is a malignancy. A biopsy is always encouraged, but it may not be possible because of patient factors or because it's obviously just a cancer. Then there would be a referral to a radiation oncologist like myself, then there would be an initial consultation in which we take a history, do a physical examination, do some, maybe uh, look over the investigations. Really, would we, we order more? They're usually all done by our very competent primary carers. Then, then but this could include the histopathology report or any imaging reports. Then we would, we would explain radiotherapy. We get the patient to consent to treatment. And then what we can organise in our centres is immediate planning. This saves a trip back for another and also gets the, the, the treatment started pretty quickly. This may involve a scan and may involve making of a personalised immobilisation device like a mask. Then treatment occurs. So this is given over weeks. Usually they're seen daily by the nurses and weekly by the radiation oncologist during this time. During this time, acute effects can develop. And I've got a case study which follows, which explains this. Then I would normally see patients four weeks after radiotherapy, and then I would discharge them back to the primary care or dermatologist for resumption of skin surveillance. This is, this is much better done by primary care and dermatology. So we're not into sort of taking patients over, we're into providing a service for, for patients, for carers who are the primary care for skin conditions. Now, there can be some costs. There usually is some out-of-pocket cost. We do treat uh, bulk billing for people who, who, who can't afford it. Unfortunately, private health insurance is poor for this outpatient procedure. We always give a discount to pensioners, and we have a lot of frequent flyers, for example, transplant patients who often have surgical fatigue or are surgically exhausted who need radiotherapy for their many skin cancers, and we're very happy to drop any out-of-pockets for this type of person because they really need treatment. What about radiotherapy compared to surgery? Well, the upside is there's no tissue loss. There's no need for anaesthetic, especially a general anaesthetic. A lot of older patients are scared of that. There's no grafts or flaps that need to be looked after. So there's no chance of failure or the need for bed rest for the graft to take. The downside, 
Sometimes there are many fractions involved, for example, a nose in which the, the functional and, and cosmesis endpoints are important. This will take five to six weeks of daily, five days a week radiotherapy to get the best result. Um, there's no histopathology because we don't remove anything. Uh, so we can't actually say, well, your lesion's been cut out because there's been no cutting. Uh, but we can treat a larger area as there is no tissue sacrifice. Let's have a look at acute side effects. So these happen during treatment and they're due to damage in normal cells that have a similar life cycle to cancer cells, but only in the irradiated field. Now these type of cells are normally dividing to maintain their function and they're based on an hierarchically organized adult stem cell population. For example, those that exist in the gut, mucosa, bone marrow or skin. And this, this hierarchical organization explains the side effects and the timing from any cytotoxic therapy. For example, in the, in the GI tract, it takes to go, for a new cell to go from being born in the crypt to being shed in the villus takes three days. So therefore, if you have radiotherapy or chemotherapy today, you'll get your diarrhea in three to five days. Same thing with the mucosa. It takes seven days for a cell to go from the basal layer to the top. And so therefore, any mucositis will happen in seven to 10 days following a cytotoxic insult. Same with the white blood cells. We all know from our resident days that, that, that the white cells start to nadir seven to 10 days following chemotherapy. And in skin, it's about 14 days from bottom of um, the, from the base of layer to the top. So that's when you get your erythema, rash and loss of hair. This is just a little diagram to show what we mean in the skin. This is the dermis here down below. There's a lot of rich blood supply here and nerve supply. This is the epidermis at the bottom of the epidermis. There are basal cells. Their job is just to have babies. They just have, they just create new keratinocytes. And then basically those keratinocytes push each other up and then they eventually move away from their blood supply and die. So that at any stage, our, our dead skin is always being sloughed off. Those who have dandruff have more of that problem. And this is what this red arrow points out here. This goes from, from, the, from the base of the layer to the top. That takes 14 days in order to do that. So therefore, radiotherapy today gives you side effects in 14 days time. So acute side effects are worse with increased or more rapid dose. They're definitely worse when we give them with chemotherapy. That, that impacts the repair capacity in normal cells and also with poor nutrition. So we have to make sure that people having radiotherapy are given, are well fed so that they can repair properly their normal cells between the radiation treatments. We need to think of acute effects as sterile acute inflammation and it needs specialist nursing care which we provide and then these things suddenly get better after about seven to ten days. So this is an elderly gentleman. He had a SEC on the back of his hand, cured by a plastic surgeon. One cell escaped though to his axilla. Later on in life, a kind GP has given him steroids for his nasty chest. Unfortunately, the steroids have dropped his immune system and whammo, that one cell has grown rapidly to, you know, lymph node in the axilla to form this ulcerated and bleeding mass. Here it is, ulcerated, bleeding, causing pain. On the CT scan, it goes all the way back to the chest wall. It's got a necrotic centre, so typical of SCC disease. Now, at 27 grey, he's been given a short, hot course of radiotherapy. We can see that there's a real difference between the biological response to radiotherapy between the normal cells, or this, this skin is getting full dose, and also the cancer cells. So this is the cancer. You can see already this yellow stuff is necrotic tissue. It's called tumor lysis. It's, it's like pus in that it's necrosis, but it's unlike pus in that it's caused by radiotherapy, not by infection. So we can see that the tumour and the normal cells react differently to radiotherapy. This is the radiotherapy field here. One week after radiotherapy has finished, this is erythema now starting within the radiation field. The tumour is getting smaller. At two weeks, there's now a significant radiation reaction. There's what's called dry desquamation. There's also bits of wet desquamation where we can really look through and see the dermis underneath the epidermis. And this is now, we're now seeing the full effect of radiotherapy because this is two weeks after the end of the radiotherapy. So this is now when those cells that should have been produced by the stem cells two weeks ago are not there because those stem cells were too busy 
protecting their own DNA from radiotherapy rather than producing new cells. At three weeks, this, this photo looks worse, but actually it's better. We can already see islands of new cells growing here to form new skin. So that at six weeks, we can see all the skin is healed. The cancer is still there, but much smaller. What radiotherapy does is it kills the cancer, but unlike surgery, does not remove it. It's up to this gentleman's normal homeostatic mechanism to remove the dead cancer. And we know that this gentleman's homeostatic mechanism is not good. That's, that's why he's in the position he is with having to have radiotherapy rather than an operation. So we can see at 18 weeks, finally, all the cancer is gone and the skin is completely healed. So this was just an example to show you about acute effects of radiotherapy and how the radiotherapy staff need to keep in contact with the patients after the radiotherapy is finished because the radiotherapy peak reaction may be after the radiotherapy has finished. This is just to show that hair, skin can heal very well, but it takes a while for this hair follicles and sweat glands to migrate back into the field they have a lot of stem cells, they take longer to recover. What about late effects? So late effects are a sterile chronic inflammation. They're dominated by fibrosis. And just like every scar, this takes time to develop. So, that, so we define late effects as starting at least six months after the radiotherapy. They usually peak at two years and they're caused by big dose per fraction. In other words, we've given too much dose per fraction and some of the normal cells have been unable to repair that amount of radiation damage and they have died and they're eventually replaced by scar tissue. These do not get better. So this is a gentleman treated quite some years ago to a skin cancer of the upper lip. Now he was treated with 36 grains, six fractions, big dose per fraction, six grain per fraction given twice a week. But you know, this is bad radiotherapy because a lot of normal cells have died. And you can see it's really ruined his smile with all this fibrosis. Uh, um, means that he's lost the elasticity of his upper lip. Now this is avoidable now that we understand the importance of fractionation and of how doing the fractionation well means that all the normal tissue can be repaired. What about new breakthroughs? Well, there's been breakthroughs in two areas, in physics and in biology. So we'll look at the physics side of things. So what we're doing here is there's been increasing conflict Formality. And these changes, just like all changes in cancer, are accelerating at an exponential rate. So what this conformality means is that we're putting more radiotherapy where the cancer is and less radiotherapy in normal surrounding tissues. Therefore, there's more cure of cancer, but less side effect in normal surrounding tissues, meaning better survivorship. So this has been helped by using computers to do our planning. It's also been helped by fusing with our planning scans, PET and MRI, so we can see cancer better, we can see soft tissues better. So there's been better localization of the cancers and uh, less need for approximations. There are also lead leaves in the treatment machine head that can move during the beam on time. In other words, we can modulate the intensity of the radiotherapy during beam on time, no therapy or IMRT. So this is the new buzzword, IMRT, intensity modulated radiotherapy. We can also put the linear accelerator, which is the device, the machine that puts out the radiotherapy into a CT ring so that we can actually have rotational therapy and so when you combine rotational therapy with IMRT, you get something called volumetric modulated arc therapy or VMAT. So VMAT has become the new beaut IMRT, being able to give IMRT-like treatments rapidly, speedily. Therefore, everyone can get the advantage of, of VMAT treatments. There's also much better localization, So we can give stereotactic treatment to the brain and body. Um, so this means we can give a very high dose to small volumes of rapid fall off. So for brain metastasis, for example, we can treat with a one-off treatment rather than people needing neurosurgery in order to cut out their brain metastasis. They walk in in the morning, have radiotherapy, walk out in the afternoon with the same result as having neurosurgery, 
but without needing anaesthetic, without needing neurosurgical intensive care, without having to cut into bone, without losing hair, without losing brain. This is the linear accelerator. We have two of these uh, at St Vincent's and two at the Mater. Uh, they retail for about from 2.1 to 3.8 million. We've got a new technology at St Vincent's opening up very soon called the MR Linac, which is a which is a magnetic resonance scanner inside a linear accelerator, so we can actually visualise the cancer with MR during the treatment, allowing adaptive planning. Now inside the head, so the radiotherapy comes out of this hole here, and out of, in this hole there are, there are all these leaves here. These are called multi-leaf collimators or MLCs, and these move during real time, during the beam on time, modulating the intensity of the beam, allowing us to treat around corners. So back in the old days, back in the 90s, this was high quality radiotherapy quality assurance. So this is basically the physicists beaming our beam onto some photographic paper with a 10 by 10 field, with a 5 by 5 field. This is high quality uh, quality assurance done back with a technique called 3D conformal radiotherapy, which is the old way of giving radiotherapy. Now it's VMAT back in the day. Now using IMRT, particularly VMAT, this becomes our quality assurance. So you can see all the all, all these little all these beamlets here, the beam, the beam, those MLCs are moving quickly, being able to break the beam up during real time. So what it means now is that we can put a big dose in a certain area, but then just a centimetre away, no dose. So there can be a lot of cancer cure here, but no side effects to normal tissues here. Much better conformality of dose. Here are some physicists on holidays. What they've done is they've put their holiday snaps into the linear accelerator and told the linear accelerator to reproduce their holiday snaps onto photographic paper. So we can also do this with MRI and PET scans so that we can really see the cancer, we can really see the soft tissue, meaning we can really increase the conformality of dose. More dose to cancer, less dose to normal structures, more cure, less side effects, better survivorship. So nowadays, we can now do, when we're treating multiple brain metastases, we can use VMAT. And so rather than just giving one dose to the whole head, which is what we used to do, we can now give a high dose to the brain mets because we've seen where the brain mets are because of fusion with the MRI scan. We can give a reasonable dose to the rest of the brain using the VMAT, which we're concerned there could be microscopic disease that could grow up here to being macroscopic disease later on and therefore causes to use more SRS or more neurosurgery in the future. We can spare the hippocampi, which we know is the center of dementia in the, in the, in the body. So if we spare this, people who are having whole bone radiotherapy will not develop dementia. We can also spare the hair so that people getting whole bone radiotherapy can have far less alopecia. So using this, we can give, you know, using this, these advances of physics, we can give great conformality, more dose to cancer, less dose to normal structures, even sparing their hair. This is basically a palliative treatment. And for people not to lose their hair is great palliation. What do physics advances mean for skin cancer? Well, we can now treat what's called field therapy. So there are many people who have big fields of skin that constantly produce new skin cancers. Now, back in the day when we had fixed radiation sources, they were very good for concave shapes. So, for example, the inner canthus or the nasal alar. So here, here we go. This is a fixed radiation point. The beam is coming out here. A nice concave uh, dose going to this BCC or SCC of the in a canthus or the nasal ala. But this wasn't so good for convex areas. And unfortunately, unfortunately, what we find is that a lot of fields are actually on convex areas. For example, scalps, 
lower legs, arms, cheeks, foreheads. So, you know, th this fixed source is not good for treating convex fields, which are usually the more common. So, but using VMAT, we can now treat convexities. This is a VMAT going around the scalp, for example, giving a very hot dose to the rind of skin on top of the brain, but very low dose to the brain. This is a gentleman with this problem. He's got live cancers, but really a lot of field change here. Now, this is what the radiation oncologist uh, on the right-hand side here. This is what the radiation, the radiation oncologist has contoured to treat all this skin right over the uh, right over the brain where the wires are here. That's macroscopic disease down to where this wire is here. That's microscopic or field change, and this is the resulting dissymmetry. So nice hot dose to the rind of scalp but very little dose going to the brain. And really, radiation-sensitive structures of the brain are deep inside here. So this gentleman will, will end up having no brain side effects from having all this scalp treated. Here's an example of someone who's got, you know, field change of the lower arm. This guy keeps on producing SCCs. He's had a long history sailing and uh, farming and uh, surfing. And he just keep, he keep, keeps on growing skin cancers out of this field change. But we've used the, the VMAT. This is two years after his treatment. You can see that the hair is starting to come back. But you can see that all that field change is gone. He's had no further need for any topical therapy or surgery for new invasive disease in this field. What about advances in radiobiology? Well, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to decrease the number of fractions. That's the painful thing for people having radiotherapy. So particularly for older people who rely on their younger family members to drive them in, uh, also if they're a bit immobilised with comorbidities or having to use a walker, you know, we've, we've developed something of the matter called the adaptive split course radiotherapy. These are the people who can't do six weeks of radiotherapy for a nose or for a, for a, for, for a field or whatever. So what we do is we give them phase one of treatment of five treatments, one a day for a week, then eight weeks off, and then phase two of another five treatments if they need it. So we noticed that in about 22 lesions that there was a 70% decrease in tumour size by phase two. So we can use a different planning technique, sometimes even a different modality of radiotherapy. And 50% of, of lesions did not need the phase two. And we published this in the British Journal of Dermatology two years ago, and this was a very highly cited publication. This is an example. This is a lady who's lying down on her back here. This is her ear. This is her right temple. She's got this nasty five centimetre VCC that the surgeon was not keen to operate on. This is her, this is a planning. This is a pre-phase two. You can already see there's been a, a large reduction in size by the time she's come for planning for phase two. And then four weeks after the end of phase two, She's had a complete response and that endures two years later. This has saved her many weeks of treatment and also saved her surgery. Many of these older patients have comorbidities. They don't want surgery because it might, they might mean a general anaesthetic, which may impact their neurocognitive function. They also may have a disability, for example, needing to be anticoagulated and the anticoagulation can work against a graft taking or a flap being successful. This is an elderly lady who had this nasty deforming BCC of her right inner canthus. She just had phase one phase of five treatments and, you know, all that cancer is gone. So she had no, no surgery. This is radiotherapy only. And we'd like to ask the question, well, why is this lady so radiation sensitive? There's certainly a lot of room here for a lot of very good scientific work to find out why older Australians in particular, with a lot of UV exposure, tend to be more radiation sensitive than, than, than younger people. This is, a, this is a lady with lentiga maligna of the lower eyelid. We know that this is a pre-invasive malignancy. Um, about 20% of all invasive malignancies come from lentiga maligna. This is a very difficult surgical fix. She had actually lentiga maligna going over into the conjunctival side of this lesion. She was treated with the machine that we have at the Marta called the superficial radiotherapy machine, a beautiful machine. And the and we can see that some time later, 
two years later, that she still has an enduring response with all that Rentig maligna having gone. So also in benign disease, we've discovered this is a lady who came to me for VMAP to the nose, which we've published on, for multifocal BCC of the nose. So she was getting all of this field treated, but getting a higher dose to these areas of biopsy proven malignancy. So we treated her uh, with VMAT, but then she came back a year later saying, look, the radiotherapy got rid of all my rosacea. And I'm so pleased with that. So not only did it control her cancers, it also got rid of all her rosacea. And we can see she actually came back to ask whether this bit of rosacea, which was outside the radiation field, could now be treated. So this is her coming back for a, for a benign condition. We've also had a lot of success in treating extra memory patch disease. This is a disease that oftentimes happens in the genital regions in which men and women are so sick of surgery, they're losing bits of their genitalia to this, but we can treat with radiotherapy using the split course in order to decrease side effects so they can tolerate this treatment very well. We have also just published on this. So we're doing a couple of trials in skin radiotherapy. This is a great research opportunity for anyone in the primary care community who would like to collaborate. Uh, if you get a certain number of people on these trials, you also will get an authorship. The first trial we have is called the SPORT trial. This is skin post-operative radiotherapy. And this is a randomized trial of observation versus post-operative radiotherapy. For those who have a skin lesion cut out, which is T1 to T2, that's up to a four centimeter BCC or SCC, where there's unexpectedly locally advanced disease found on the histopathology report. So we, we know that there are absolute indications for giving radiotherapy in this situation where a positive margin, a T4 lesion, symptomatic perineal infiltration, uh, recurrence after previous surgery. These are all detailed very well on the EBIQ website for the New South Wales Cancer Council. But there are many other intermediate risk factors, for example, incidental perineal infiltration, lymphovasospace invasion, a close deep margin, uh, uh, poor differentiation. Should we give radiotherapy or not? There's absolutely no data out there. This is a trial with hopefully 150 per arm, and we will really make some discoveries here for the world in order to really guide whether these people need radiotherapy or not. Another randomized trial is called the Smooth Skin Randomized Trial. This is basically looking at 5FU, which is a current treatment for fields, versus VMAT to see. What is the durability of our treatment for VMAT? Is VMAT just as good as 5FU, which is the current industry leader following the Janssen trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine late last year? We're also looking at a phase one, two trial in rosacea to see whether these, we've had four patients with rosacea who were treated because they had skin cancers on their nose treated, whose rosacea has, disappe has just disappeared within the field. Is this, just a peculiarity of those four patients, or is this really an enduring response? We know that rosacea has no known cure. So this could be finally at last a cure for patients with troublesome recalcitrant rosacea. Another study is called the gentler study. And this is for the patients who need VMAT for fields, but can't come in for five weeks of daily treatment because of frailty or, or mobility issues. This is looking at 15 fractions given over five weeks to see whether less intensive fractionation can also work in these older patients with mobility problems. We're also writing up a few retrospective studies, looking at VMAT in extended skin field cancerization of all sites, including, including uh, scalps and legs. The radiotherapy of lesions in the legs, this is, this is a, an area that is very misunderstood, that radiotherapy can be given to the legs if it's given properly. Also, radiotherapy to the nose, ears, and eyelids. These are organs in which you really want to maintain your tissue. And so, you know, can you give radiotherapy and what, what effect does it have in comparison to surgery at a local level here in Sydney? So, we're writing up all these things, mainly in conjunction with students from the University of New South Wales, but I'm the primary author. So, well, hopefully, we'll be publishing those in the next half year or so. So, let's go on and summarize what we've talked about today. We've looked at how radiotherapy works and what radiotherapy does is it brings tissue conservation to skin cancer so that people can keep their normal tissue. 
We've also looked at the RT process for patients, that it is all about fractionation. We've looked at side effects, the mechanisms of acute reactions, the mechanisms of late reactions. We also looked at new breakthroughs, mainly in physics, which is all about increasing the conformality of dose, therefore getting more dose to cancer, increasing the cure rate, less dose to normal tissues, therefore decreasing the side effects, both of those areas leading to better survivorship with radiotherapy versus other therapies. We also looked at radiobiology. How can we get around the number of fractions we need to give? Can we make it easier for some patients to come to treatment, whereas they'd be put off by having to come for weeks of treatment on end? So thanks very much. This is my final slide. Thanks very much for the opportunity and for your attention so far. I'm very happy to take any questions. My contacts are the following. This is my mobile number. This is my email address. And I'm based at the Martyr on the north side of the harbour. I'm also at St Vincent's on the south side. Thank you so much for your attention.